12, we're going to start at verse 37. So let's pray and ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this portion of scripture. We thank you for the information and the message that's in it. We pray that it would come alive in our hearts and encourage us in our walk with you. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there are several times that I have uh, been discouraged, maybe is the, is the right word. Um, I, I've wondered, uh, am I accomplishing anything? You preach the gospel week after week after week. You share the word of God week after week. Is anybody listening? Is any life being changed? Is it ever making a difference in anybody's heart and anybody's walk? And, uh, and so I, as you know, been as a pastor for all these many years, uh, I can identify and relate to what Jesus was going through when he begins this speech that he starts in verse 37. And he starts out with a question. He says, you know, uh, to who has believed our report? Is anybody listening? Uh, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Has anybody noticed what I've been doing? And, and so I want to walk through this text as we identify with the, the frustration that must have been on the heart of Jesus as he reviewed in his mind the various aspects of ministry that he's gone through and, 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 and what would have been discouraging to him as he thought about all the people who didn't believe, all the people who walked away from him, all the people who decided not to follow him. From a human standpoint, it must have been a discouraging thing for him to go through. But, but what is encouraging is his example that he didn't allow the discouragements of ministry to have the victory. Amen. Uh, that as you, as you trek through what Jesus is saying here, he didn't allow himself to get down. But as a matter of fact, he pursued his love for us all the way to Calvary. And this portion of scripture comes to us right in the middle of, of that Passion Week. He's there in Jerusalem waiting for his opportunity to be arrested and taken to the cross and to be the Lamb of God. He knows exactly what's in front of him, and yet he, he is willing to go through all of that even in the face of discouragement because he didn't allow the discouragement to have the victory. And so while ministry can be very discouraging, I want to leave you with the example of Jesus and encourage you today to keep on keeping on. Amen. To, to keep on pressing on, to do what God has called you to do. Whatever area of ministry that is, to keep on pressing on and don't allow the discouragements of ministry to have the victory. In verse 37, I noticed that Jesus had done all the things that was given to him to do up to that point. Jesus had, had healed the sick people. He had given sight to the blind. He raised the dead. Jesus had, had, had performed all these miracles and signs and wonders. He gave all these demonstrations of who he was. And the people here witnessed these signs and miracles, the healing and the grace. He demonstrated who he was and, and who he claimed to be from his miraculous birth to his very miraculous baptism and the demonstration of the dove, the declaration of who he was from heaven, to the transfiguration when, when uh, he was changed and, and the glory of God was seen to his disciples. Uh, all of those things, all those signs and wonders that people saw and yet they still didn't believe. Yet they still walked away. It was a discouraging time for Jesus. And so he's questioning uh, what in the world is going on here. Uh, they, they, the reason for the unbelief is given in the text and was prophesied by the prophet. And the reason is always the hardness of our hearts. And this is actually an encouragement to us as those of you that do any... Anybody here ever witnessed anybody? Oh, just a couple. Anybody here ever told anybody that Jesus is the answer? A few more hands. 
Anybody ever told them that Jesus died for your sins? Well, if you're involved in witnessing and sharing the gospel with people, then you know right up front that it can be a very discouraging proposition. Uh, there is rejection. There is uh, walking away. There are times when people don't want to hear what you have to say. Uh, and no matter what you do, they're just not going to respond. And the reason is always the hardness of their hearts. Now, why do I say that's an encouragement to us? It's an encouragement to us because guess what? The response to the gospel is God's business. Amen. The response to the gospel is out of my hands. You see, there are some people that God has hardened their hearts. Now, let me slow down here and make sure that you track with me. When you read in the book of Exodus and you read about, uh, you know, God hardening Pharaoh's heart, what's very interesting about the book of Exodus is that about 10 times it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And about another 10 times, an equal number of times, it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So the question is, well, which is it? Did God harden Pharaoh's heart or did Pharaoh harden his own heart? And the fact of the matter is that both are true. And when you decide that you're not going to believe God, when you decide that you're not going to follow after him, that, that you're not going to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, then, then you harden your heart and God will come alongside and confirm that hardness. And that's a very dangerous place to be when God hardens your heart. Because you see, none of us come to Christ of our own steam. None of us wake up in the morning and decide that we're going to accept Christ. It's only as the Spirit of God draws us. It's only as the Spirit of God works in our hearts and in our lives and pulls us to himself that we respond to the gospel. But when you reject the gospel, there's coming a time when the Spirit of God is going to stop striving with you. Amen. And when he stops striving with you and confirms the hardness of your heart, you're in a dangerous place. That's a, that's a bad place to be. And so I say to you today that, that if you are under conviction of the Holy Spirit, if the Spirit of God is bothering you about sin in your life, if the Spirit of God is bothering you about your relationship with him, if he's drawing you into a closer relationship with himself, then that's good. Amen. It's good when the Spirit of God is still convicting you because that means that he's still striving with you. But, but, but when it doesn't bother you anymore, amen, when you're out there doing your thing and you don't give it two thoughts and it's not bothering you anymore, you're in a dangerous, dangerous place. And so if I'm talking to anybody in that place, you need to bow down right now and confess and, and ask for mercy from God that he would soften your heart and open your heart to the gospel. But, but Jesus had done all that he could do. He had shown all these signs and wonders, and yet and still they didn't believe. And the reason for their unbelief was the hardness of their hearts. And, and, and so our job is simply to share the gospel. Our job is simply to demonstrate the life of Christ and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our job. And, and all the results and all the numbers and all that other stuff, we leave with God. He's the one who's going to bring the, the increase when we do our part. And so Jesus didn't let the discouragement of the unbelievers in his ministry have the victory. He kept on pressing on. And I want to encourage you that Jesus then gives us an example that we can follow so that we don't get discouraged by doing ministry. Amen? That we don't allow that discouragement to have the victory. Look at verse 39 and 40. It's very interesting what's going on here. In verses 39 and 40 says, Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. 
You see, it was prophesied, and this is going back 700 years before Christ. It was prophesied that these people weren't going to believe. You know what? When there are unbelievers, it doesn't take God by surprise. When there are people that reject him, it doesn't take God by surprise. He knew all about it. In fact, it it was prophesied uh, that that's what Jesus is referring to from the prophet Isaiah, that these people were not going to accept, that he was going to come and they were not going to accept. But it didn't take God by surprise that there were all these people who refused to believe. But that doesn't change our mission. That doesn't change our job. Our job is to demonstrate the life of Christ and to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Are you hearing me? And so we need to continue to do our job even when people reject. Just like there will always be the poor among us, there will always be unbelievers. But just because there will always be poor among us doesn't mean that we should stop helping the poor. And just because there are going to be people who reject the gospel doesn't mean that we stop sharing the gospel. Are you hearing me? And so in in both cases, we know that they're always going to be poor. We know that they're always going to be unbelievers. But he has called us to a mission, and we need to be about that mission. And we should not allow the discouragements of ministry to have the victory in our lives. The fact is that none of us can brag about our faith in God. Uh, Unless the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, unless the Spirit of God draws you, uh, you can't come to him. And so I've said many times, there's not going to be anybody strutting around heaven with their chest out saying, you know, I was smart. At least I was smart enough to come in. What are you, a dummy? You know, at least I had enough sense. But you know what? Let's just stop and think about how you came to Christ. There are very few people who came to Christ because they examined all the evidence and they looked at all the scriptures, they reviewed all the prophets and they they came to the conclusion that, you know, the Bible really does seem to be a reliable source of truth. And then we read all the other books that claim to be truth and we see that the Bible is superior to all of them. And so and so uh, after examining all the facts, we make an intelligent decision that that we're going to accept Christ. No, that's not how you came to Christ. That's not how I came to Christ. We come to Christ because the spirit of God draws us. It wasn't your intellectual exercise. It wasn't your smarts that brought you to Jesus. It's the the spirit of God working in your heart. And so when you come to to wake up in God's heaven one day, you're not going to be praising your intellect. You're going to be thanking God that he reached down and pulled you out of that muck and mire. Amen. Amen. You know what? Picture it this way. I, I, I always, I think of it as if you were sinking in quicksand and you're sinking and sinking and sinking and now you're up to your neck and it's just your hands and your head that's above the quicksand, you're going down and somebody throws you a lifeline and you grab onto that lifeline and they pull you up, you're not going to be, you know, bragging about how smart you were. You're not going to be bragging about how, you know, intelligent you were to, to, that you picked a good option. You, all your praise and all your thanks and all your gratitude is going to go to that person who threw out the lifeline for you. And I want to tell you that, that Jesus is that savior. Jesus is that, is that round Lifesaver that you grabbed on to. And the Spirit of God is the rope, that line that, that got it out to you. And, uh, and all praise and all glory goes to him. When we get to heaven, all of our rewards, all of our praise, all of our thanks, it's all going to be laid at his feet, and we're just going to worship and thank him. And so uh, when, you, when you realize the situation that you were pulled out of, you don't grab any credit for yourself. And, and, and you know what? When, when you stop and think about it, 
uh, I mentioned this morning, I said that, you know, my dad used to talk about um, people who snarl at the word saved as though saved. You know, I could hear my father now, saved? What do you mean by saved? And uh, so, so uh, you know, it, that's the, there are a lot of people who don't like the term saved. You know, like you're saved, it's like putting down, you know, it's beneath you to talk about saved. But let me tell you something. Anybody who's been pulled out of the quicksand, who understands the dilemma that they were in, I don't mind talking about saved. I was saved. I was pulled out one day by the grace of God. And when you understand the dilemma and the guilt that God has pulled us out from, you can call it saved, you can call it rescued, you can call it whatever you want. I'm just glad he called me and called me out. Amen? And so, and so uh, we don't deserve any, any credit of our own. It's all God. And so it's God's work. And as God's work, it's an encouragement to you and I as we share the gospel because our job is just simply to share the gospel, to demonstrate the life of Christ and to proclaim the gospel of Christ. And we need to make sure that uh, we're not counted in the, in the number of those people who are rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we're not discouraged in the ministry that we do. We spend so much every day. Time, money, we use up, we waste so much. We spend time and money every day until it's all gone. Precious resources, powerful resources. What if you, what if you reinvested your time into prayer, your resources into support to help us plant churches, prepare leaders, and proclaim the gospel? What if you became a prayer fellowship partner? GOGF has been planting churches, preparing leaders, and proclaiming the gospel throughout the world since 1961. 14 churches on the eastern seaboard, producing weekly radio broadcasts that reach around the globe. We have ministry training in India, Africa, and the Caribbean. Partner with us. Partner with God. Invest in expanding and supporting His kingdom worldwide. Become a prayer fellowship partner. You have the time and resources to make a difference. Also in verse 4, as he talks about this hardness of heart, uh, when you push away the lifeline, the time is going to come when the lifeline is going to be withdrawn and you'll be stuck in the quicksand of your unbelief. If you're listening to me now and you've never understood your guilty status as a sinner before a holy God, then I beg you not to leave here today without accepting, without grabbing on to Jesus and allowing him to pull you out. You know, I was, um, as, a, as a college student, it was during the years that my dad operated a summer camp up there in Percocet. And uh, at Camp Sky Mountain, 129 acres. And we had kids up from the city in Baltimore, New York, and everything and that was there in the summer. And, uh, you know, during those years, I was a lifeguard. And I was a counselor at the camp and a lifeguard around the pool. And I remember, you know, many a time you walk around the pool with those sticks that you can pull into the water and pull somebody out. And uh, those little round lifesavers that you can toss in and give somebody some help. Only one time can I remember that I actually physically had to jump into the pool and uh, to, to pull somebody out. But, uh, but usually you throw in a little help. And you pull them in off to the side and they can, they can find their way off to the side. And uh, I can't recall any drowning swimmer who ever got that lifesaver in front of them who said, get that out of my face. <laughs> what do you think I am? Who do you think I am? I don't need that. No, when somebody is drowning, Amen. When somebody is sinking, when somebody understands the dilemma that they're in, uh, they'll grab on to that, that lifesaver and allow you to pull them in. And so, and so for us as lifeguards in the pool of God's kingdom, we need to understand that our ministry has a lot at stake. There are lives at stake. 
There are people drowning in the pool of life who are just waiting and needing for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be thrown to them. Guess what? There are people in your family that need the gospel. There are people on your job that need the gospel. All of us have unsaved people in our circle, and, and, and yet we find it so difficult to share the gospel, to throw the good news out to them. Why? Because we're afraid of the rejection. We're afraid of, of all those things that are, that are stopping us, the discouragement of ministry. And I want to challenge you not to allow the discouragement of ministry to have the victory. But in verse 42... Some didn't confess because they worried about social approval. Now, this should sound familiar. If you remember in John chapter 9, when Jesus healed the blind man, you remember that story? The man that was born blind and Jesus spit on the ground and put the mud pies in his eyes and, and healed him. Uh, one of the things that, that happened is that as this man was healed, the Pharisees and the scribes and the rulers at the time, they asked, uh, they asked this man, you know, did Jesus really heal you? And then they asked his parents, uh, was this guy really born blind? Did Jesus really heal him? And the parents said, he's of age, ask him. Uh, because, and the text says there in John 9, that they didn't want to confess who Jesus was because they didn't want to be kicked out of the synagogue. You see, what, what would happen is back then, the synagogue was like the center of social life in the community. The synagogue was where everybody gathered. It was the in crowd. If you were an outcast and not a member in the synagogue, then you were out in the outskirts of society. And so they were afraid that they were going to be kicked out of the synagogue. So the parents of the man born blind, they didn't want to make a confession. And some of these rulers that Jesus is talking to here in chapter 12, the text says they believed, but they didn't want to confess. They didn't want to open their mouths. They didn't want to say too much. Why? Because they were concerned about the approval of men. And now let's, let's be honest with ourselves. I think some of us can identify with that. We don't open our mouths. We don't confess Jesus around uh, the people on the job and people that we come in contact with. Why? Because we want the approval of men. We don't want people to think that we're nuts. We don't want people to think that we're one of those fanatics. We want people to look at us and, and think that we're respectable, intelligent people. And so we don't confess Jesus on the job. And we don't confess Jesus among our relationships. We keep our mouths shut when we're out in public. Why? Because we have allowed the world to relegate us into our little prayer closet, to reduce our Christianity into the four walls of the church and the little prayer closet at home. And when you step out the door into the public square and the public marketplace, the world has effectively shut our mouths because we want public approval. I see y'all in the restaurant. You know, you see them in the restaurant. <laughs> Why is that? Because we don't want anybody to think we're one of those nuts. Amen. Amen. And, and, you know, I, I, was, I was saying this morning that I spend some time, sometimes I just need to get out of the office. So when I'm working on a message, I like to go to Giant out there in Hatfield. And I've seen a number of Monco people walking through Giant. But, uh, but I go and sit down in the internet cafe there, and I have my Bible out, and I have my laptop, and uh, maybe another book or two, reference material, and I'm working on a message. And uh, I have had so many conversations with people that just got started because they saw me sitting there with my Bible out. Amen. Amen. Now, I could have, you know, you can, you can get your digital option, put your Bible away so nobody will see, and just use that little digital, you know, alternative, and nobody will know what you're looking at. 
But why should we hide what we're doing? Why should we stick Jesus into the background somewhere? I'm suggesting that we should not be discouraged by public rejection. We need to know up front that not everybody is going to like it. Not everybody is going to accept it. Not everybody is going to believe it. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a minister of the gospel, don't let discouragement have the victory. Right. Are you hearing me? Let's, let's go out there proud with our chin up and our chest out and be who God's called us to be and uh, accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. And so for many people, the acceptance and the praise of men is the high motivation in their lives. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And when visible men become more tangible than the invisible God, we have a problem. And that's exactly where we are with a lot of us. And this becomes a challenge for us. We all struggle with wanting to be liked. And sometimes our desire to be liked by men means that we're not pleasing to God. You know, social approval has become a big issue for some that it keeps us from following Jesus. And some of us are unwilling to give up those friends some of us are unwilling to give up those relationships that hold us back and to tie our hands. Uh, some of us are so concerned about, about our appearance to other people that we, we fail to do and to be what God has called us to be. I, I, was, I think about the movie Titanic. Everybody saw Titanic? If you haven't seen it by now, forget it. But uh, in the movie Titanic, what I was thinking is that, you know, you have all these rich elite people with their frills and, you know, you see them down in the dining room and the social elite that are down there. But guess what? When the ship started going down, they weren't worried about their frills. You saw them scrambling for that lifeboat. They weren't trying to keep their press, you know, their, their crease in line. They, they weren't worried about their appearance anymore. They were scrambling, climbing over each other, trying to get to that lifeboat. And so I want to tell you that, that we need to understand what is at stake in our ministry. We need to understand that the, the demonstration and the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, there are lives at stake. And we can't afford to be worrying about how our appearance is. We can't afford to be worrying about if people are going to approve or disapprove or like me or am I going to be accepted by them or what do they think about about me. Let's be pleasing to God rather than being men pleasers. Amen. Amen. And so I want to, I just want to challenge you to, to be encouraged and allow God to use you and not let society hold you back. If you seek the Lord first in your life, ahead of everyone else, you're going to find him and you'll be able to point others to him as well. But also, I want you to notice that some didn't believe because they loved the darkness rather than the light. Look at verses 44 and following. He says, then Jesus cried out. Everybody there? And he said, he who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my, my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words, he has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now, what, what Jesus is doing here is he is referring them back to and alluding back to what he talked about earlier in the book, and that is that Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. And Jesus is saying that, that there are some people who don't want to walk in the light. They don't want to walk in the light because they love the darkness. Their deeds are evil 
and they love the darkness. If you're busy sharing the gospel, it's not going to take you very long to run up against the fact that there are some people who just love what they're doing. They love the deeds of the flesh. They, and they not about to quit. And you can preach till the sweat is dropping off your brow, but they want to do what they want to do. They want to walk in the darkness. And some of us love the deeds of the flesh and don't want to give any of that up. Illicit relationships, pornography, malice, unforgiveness, greed, comfort, the pursuit of happiness, lying, anger, stealing, gossip. There's a whole list of stuff. If you go to Ephesians chapter 4, it lays out for you the deeds of the flesh, the deeds of darkness that we're supposed to put off. But, but there, are, there is an unwillingness for many, not, not this crowd, but there's an unwillingness for many to not walk away from the darkness and follow the light. And I guess what I want to say is, as a minister, as someone who is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, you should not be discouraged because you run up against people who just want to do what they want to do. Keep preaching the gospel. Keep sharing the word. Don't get discouraged. And maybe I'm talking to somebody here, and you love the deeds of the flesh, Maybe there are some aspects of walking in the darkness that have you trapped and have have you bound and you're not walking in the light the way God wants you to walk in the light. That, That we need to make sure that we are following the light. There are many people who don't believe because they love the darkness rather than the light. One other thing I want you to see in this portion of scripture, in this section here, verse 44 and following, is that, is that love is the principle that guides us in the light. That, that when we, when, love is the regulating force in the life of all who've been rescued from the quicksand. When, when you know that God has pulled you out of that quicksand, There is a love for God and a love for other people that are still drowning in the quicksand. And that love is going to be enough to motivate you and drive you to to try and pull them out as well. So a person who's been rescued, who's been saved, uh, that kind of person is not the person who walks around the pool and throws stones at people in the pool. Amen. Not the kind of person who's walking around the edge, busting on and criticizing the people that are still sinking in the quicksand. Oh, you're not hearing me. The person who rescued himself, who understands that he's standing on the side in safety, simply by the grace of God, is, is, is trying to grab at a lifesaver to throw it in to help that next person to come out. To, to share the good news of salvation, to, to, to help rescue that next person. Not criticize the fact that they're wailing in the darkness, not able to help themselves. Not criticizing the fact that, that what they're doing is not really constructive. Not criticizing the fact that they're expending a lot of energy in a wasteful way that's not going to get them back into relationship with God. But rather than criticizing, we should be sharing the gospel. We should be throwing the lifeline. We need to allow love to regulate our actions so that we're we're trying to pull them out. You see, it it would do no good to have somebody who's sinking in the quicksand to be acting like a lifeguard while they're in the quicksand. And that's what I think a lot of Christians want. We're trying to change the behavior of the person who's sinking in the quicksand. Don't change the behavior, pull them out. And then when gratitude fills their heart, they'll begin to act the way that God wants them to act and walk in the light. And the thing about love is that love is like that energizer bunny. You know, love, it will keep you going through the discouragements. 
Has anybody here ever been discouraged? I, I saw a few hands that have been ministers and shared the gospel. If you've shared the gospel, anybody here ever been discouraged in ministry? Anybody? Oh, a few, okay. Well, I'll put my hand up too. I've been right there too, right along with you. When discouragement comes and you're in the face of rejection and in the face of uh, unbelief, and it seems like, you know, you're not accomplishing anything. Love is what keeps you going. Love for God and sharing that love with people around us. Isn't that our mission? To make disciples that love God and share his love with the world. And so when we have that love overflowing in our hearts, a love for God and a love for people that desires to see them rescued, that desires to see them uh, effectively pulled out by the gospel of Jesus Christ, then that love will keep you going through all the discouragements of ministry. And so then we can follow the example of Jesus and not allow the discouragement of ministry to have the victory in our lives, to cause us to throw in the towel. And so it's, it's discouraging when you see so many that love to walk in darkness and refuse the wisdom of God. And then lastly, in verse 48, I'll take you here and then we're done. There are many today uh, who uh, the consequence for unbelief is judgment. Uh, if you have not received Christ as your savior, the consequence is judgment. And, and so... You know, there are preachers today who want to downplay the reality of heaven and hell. I'm talking about a lot of churches that just don't want to talk about the reality of heaven and hell. And if you take a poll, you know, the surveys say that most Americans, they like to talk about heaven. They believe in heaven, but they don't believe in hell. And what's that about? How do you believe in heaven and you can't believe in hell. You know what that's about? We want to believe what we want to believe. That's what that's about. As though whatever I want to believe is true. That's crazy thinking. The fact of the matter is, I prefer to not trust what I want to believe, but trust what Jesus said. And Jesus testified to the reality of both heaven and hell. And so what that tells me is that if we all stand under the judgment of God and there is a reality of hell, then our ministry matters. Our ministry, there's a lot at stake. There are lives at stake in your family, in your community, in your circle of influence. And while you're out there trying to be cute for the crowd, there are people dying in a Christless eternity. And so we need to not be concerned about the social acceptance and we need to not be so concerned about, you know, the, the discouragement of ministry and the people who are not believing. We need to, out of a heart of love, recognize that as long as there is unbelief, there is a judgment of God. And there is a lot at stake. And so we continue to preach the gospel. We continue to share the good news. And we don't allow the discouragement and the unbelief to have the victory in our lives. Amen? Or can you join me in that? And let's do that. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes.